So here we are, sharing secrets of the soil with me, your host, Regen Ray. Matt Powers, welcome to the Secrets of the Soil podcast. Hello, soil lovers. I'm super excited to dig deeper today with our podcast guest because I know, seeing all the stuff that Matt does on his Facebook and socials that he really gets his hands dirty. So welcome to the show, Matt. Tell everyone a little bit about who you are. Hey, I am an educator. I was a high school teacher. Uh, Before that, I was a professional musician, but uh, I found that teaching turned something on in me and I couldn't turn it off. (laughs) I love working with people and empowering them, giving them the answers and uh, providing solutions and providing them the tools and skills that they can solve problems themselves and improvise and be creative uh, with the, the primary tools that, that, that drive our world. And I was originally an English teacher, but then I became a permaculture teacher and then I got kind of hooked on soil. I feel you. I feel you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so I was, I was a teacher where there was no, there was no, there was no curriculum. We had to create it all from scratch. And so I started doing that for permaculture. And then I started doing that for soil and I love soil. I've been working with soil for over a decade. I've been seed saving, gardening and, and writing about all this and studying it. And it was interesting, Ray, you, you, you said that, you know, you're always wanting to learn more. The amazing thing about soil is we know um, we, we know enough to participate in it, finally improve the right actions, but we're in a relationship where we're learning from soil. Healthy soil is still something very new to so many people and in so many uh, contexts. We've not really seen it have its day. So we're all, we're in the seat of just learning so much for what's possible like like we we don't know how much plants can produce really we don't know how fast they can produce really we don't know how we know that they can be resistant to pests and diseases and viruses but but to to the extent that like it could affect everything affect the entire food supply We 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 haven't seen those things happen and, and, and when we do, I believe that not only will we see completely different soil, but we are gonna see that our food truly is our medicine. And, 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 and the insights that we're learning right now in soil are actually affecting medicine, actually affecting our, our, what, what I eat. <laughs> and, 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 so, and so, yeah, I feel that we're learning and it's so fun because there's always something new to add and it's thrilling. You know, I didn't think that like five, 10 years ago even that, that it would be thrilling, but it's so cutting edge. It affects everything. It's this linchpin of understanding and it makes sense because it's what we all came from, where all the plants you know live and we eat plants or we eat animals that eat plants everything revolves around the soil, everything returns to soil. And so I I really love exploring these ideas. I love talking about different methods. I love interviewing people who do it on a farm scale, on a garden scale, all the different methods because they all have merit, they all have context and and, and and of course caveats, but, but we're all learning from each other. So I love it. I, I can't get enough. <laughs> you know, I'm addicted there with you and I can't get enough of it as well. And I agree, like the more that we are discovering about the connectivity of all our soils and the food and the animals and the ecosystems, it's like, I sit here sometimes and wonder how did we end up with a system that we have when, you know, the solutions were so in our face and right there in front of us. And we've really complicated it as a, as a species. Um, and so that's why I've created this podcast is why we, you know, I've gone all in on, on, on soil and basically turn my life into what can I do today to make soil better than what it was yesterday? You know, so much so that we've made our avatar in the business because it's living is soil now, not who you are on the planet, but what you're doing to serve our soil. And I'm super excited to hear your experience. And, and even like knowing that you've come from a teaching and, and facilitating background and that education, 
that's one of my core values as well. And so when these worlds collided, I got really, really excited uh, about how I can use my skills of empowering and educating and mentoring people and coaching them, but applying it to soils and that living organism. So I know you've got a whole book about fun facts of soil, but uh, what's something that blew your mind? I think it's behind you. Yeah. For our watchers, there's a book on the screen. If you're listening to the podcast, the link will definitely be around the video and in the show notes. <laughs> and uh, it's called Regenerating Soils. Uh, so what, what, tell me why you decided to write a book. So the longest chapter in the permaculture student two was on soil and it was the fungi section with Peter McCoy was a close second in the scientific rigor, but Elaine Ingham worked with me one-on-one -on, -one on that section. And so it was very, uh, very deep in the biology and the soil uh, food web perspective and she she's fluent you know I mean she started looking at micros micros uh, like she started doing biological assays for her father at the University of Minnesota when she was six wow so the the fluency that that develops and I've seen it in my son my son's fluent at music because we, we started playing when he was a toddler, I mean, around like 12 months old, maybe a little bit older, started playing music. And so there's a fluency that comes from that, that sometimes they know things and they can't even explain it. And it's been pretty amazing to see the new science emerge and like, like Elaine Ingham's uh, principles for why the soil food web works the way it works the principles for the benefits have remained true, even though she didn't, she couldn't see the invisibles, uh, the endophytes and the microbes sucked up by the roots themselves that are eaten by the roots because it took a mycologist who they, they like stains. So they were taking a mycologist to find that. Wow. So it's, it's all of these people working together and it's this constant and, and those stains were just in the past three months created to prove the final step of, of rhizophagy. Wow. So it's a currently unfolding story. And I got just this huge download from Elaine and worked a lot with her one on one. And it was like this connective chapter in the heart of my big purple book. It's over a 400 page book, the first peer reviewed uh, permaculture book and the first uh, cited textbook on permaculture since 1989, Bill Mollison, a permaculture de uh, designer's manual. And so it was the heart of that. And so I was like, okay, what should I write next? I put out a poll. It was like permaculture gardening, go all general, you know, go back, you know, down a step, right, right, more general instead of more specific. And consistently, people are just saying, keep going, you know, keep going up. And so that's why I did the Advanced Permaculture Student Online. That's why I did that big purple book, uh, peer reviewed and all that stuff. And then it was the first accredited in North America. And so overwhelmingly people are like, do a book on soil. And so I was like, oh, this is gonna be easy. I'm just <laughs> gonna flesh out that 45 page chapter. It's gonna be a lean book. Oh man, so easy. Pocket size. <laughs> no, no, no. It did not turn out that way. It, it, it ballooned into almost a 300 page book. And I had to learn to illustrate because I was, there was no way that A, I could afford to pay for the revisions constantly. Cause I'm like, oh wait, I read another article. I gotta fix that. <laughs> like, I, I mean, this is why it took me so long to finish it because I had to make things visual and then run them by the experts, like several experts. Because A, I mean, you guys know how science is done. It's like, there's a guy who studies this aspect, but he doesn't study any of that aspect, but it's all <laughs> happening at the same time, but they never talk to each other. So you have the chemist, you've got the, you've got the biologist, they don't talk. You've got, the, you know what I mean? You've got the geologist who's all minerals, and, and they don't talk to that. And these silos that our education system have created is exactly what permaculture, regenerative ag, and a lot of these new innovative ways of thinking are addressing. They're actually looking at the connections and overlaps between the sciences. Yeah. So it makes a lot of sense. And it's, it's really um, 
once you get past like the permaculture or, or other lingo, you know, um, it's it, it's really just that. It's it's a it's a connecting sciences that were siloed, and uh, and and sometimes you know like histories that weren't weren't shared and stuff. And yeah. so I, I I basically wrote it because folks you know said they wanted it, and then I did a Kickstarter, and then I like got into the research and was like, I got to learn chemistry. Oh no no I don't I. Oh no! I didn't sign up. For it, like, <laughs> I got scared for for real though. Like, yeah, yeah. Like I know. A while there, where I got really worried because I was like, I remember being not so good at this part. You know what I mean? <laughs> because high school chemistry, high school biology, the way these things are taught is not in a way that's empowering. It's not in a way that's memorable. And like, as an educator, I would say that they didn't understand what authentic teaching and authentic learning was. Uh, this is why, you know, when I was a teacher, I would tell teachers that um, they're paid to do their job during the time they're allotted. That means during the classroom, they don't need to spill over their job onto family time and after hours with homework if they're actually doing their job. Mm. They didn't like that, but I had the data to prove that if you actually taught people in an authentic, empowering way, they loved it because it connected to what their passions were and the goals they had in their lives. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly, hey, I didn't need to teach to the test. I didn't need to assign homework. They did homework and I mean, they did work at home for themselves independently using skills they learned in class. So it was a complete paradigm shift and I was getting higher uh, like scores in the, um, the state standardized testing. So, so I'm a passionate educator and I, I encountered these amazing science teachers and, and professors and, and researchers like Dr. Leningham, Dr. Olivia Husson, Dr. James E. White, or James F. White, excuse me. And they, they all took the time to educate me one-on-one -on -one and gave me the, the fluency and the confidence because I'm, I, I would make pictures of these things and they would be like, oh, no, 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 Matt. You got the right idea, but no, no, no. Wow. And like, so I got like schooled over and over and over again until I like really understood it. And that's the beauty of this book and of the way that I really had to understand it visually so that it was real to me because otherwise it's just numbers and, and just like garbled words, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I, I feel like I, I just kind of, um, I got asked to do this book in a way and then I got really scared and asked for help. And then I got so intrigued by the answers that, that led me through the difficulty. And then when I got through the difficulty, it was like learning a, a new language or learning about permaculture and it opened up everything in my life. And so the, I changed the way I eat. I'm way healthier than I've ever been. My stomach, my Crohn's doing better than it's ever done, been. I'm not a doctor. Th these realizations are pretty unbelievable. Um, like just for instance, uh, when we look at like, like really red or purple or rich anthocyanin blushes on tomatoes, you know, those are antioxidants, right? The reality is antioxidant, it, the opposite of oxidation is, is electrons, which is electrical, which is energy. And so it's like, once I began to realize that all foods that are high antioxidants are high in energy, and that's why they're so good for us, it changed everything and created this new lens, a very simple lens that's changed everything for me. So wow. that's I'm in cool. it, I'm in it all the way now. Yep. It's, 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 it's changed everything about me. <laughs> I love it. And it's a pure gift to the, to the planet. And I've seen so many raving reviews about it and I, I see it climbing up the charts uh, on Amazon and uh, you know, I would love to get a physical copy here in Australia and we'll chat offline about maybe doing a bulk delivery here because uh, I know the shipping to Australia is astronomically expensive at the moment, but uh, it's on your Amazon. It's, it's in your Amazon. Oh, it's so on it's demand. Printed. Yeah. It, because I wanted it to be, all right, so it means so much to me that these books are printed on the continent where people are getting them. You know, I yeah. Mean, like for real, it freaks me out. Like, I mean, ocean travel now is already so risky. It's like people lose ships like now. So that aside, 
It's it's just too much waste. Yeah. Too far. Too expensive. I've got the digital version, but a physical copy, I just think it will be magical. So I'm going to head off to Amazon and, and check that out. And of course, the links will be around this podcast and the notes. You've mentioned the word regenerative a lot, and I'm very curious to hear everyone's view on what that word means to them personally, because there is a bit of a mixed opinion in the space. And uh, what I love about you know this movement of regenerative and tying it into what you've just spoken about, there's what happens in the lab, and then there's what happens on the field. and. Right you know, sometimes what's happening on the field speaks volumes. And so I love that people are now starting to bring that science into their own backyard and experimenting on different paddocks and different spaces, balconies, pots, uh, you name it, veggie patches, gardens. And there's this word regenerative. What does that actually mean to you? Yeah. So l- let's look at the range and then I'll tell you where I'm at because on one side of the range is like, well, regenerative ag is a certification proposed by the Rodale Institute that is going to be a government policy that will become political football, probably like organic did. Absolutely. And so it's like a strict definition. It um, has politics layered in or infused, and then it can change once it's in, once it's absorbed by the politic, the political field. And they're like, okay, We'll give you this certification. Their hands are on it. So things can change. Because of that, I don't I don't use that definition. Me neither. Yep. So I'm on the other side where the definition can feel open and accessible to everyone and all behaviors and basically permaculture like is a noun and regenerative is an adjective, right? So regenerative is consistently making things better in terms of the holistic ecosystem. So that includes our interests, that includes the interests of the planet, and then those interests on into the future. So it implies that things get better over time. And when it comes to soil, there, there's, there's very specific indicators of those things. But when it become, comes to everything, I mean, we're all trying to make the world a better place. Like that kind of simple thing, like I just got to chill. And, it, and it's because that literally is like what we all really want. We're, we're all just trying to do that. Yeah. And if we can make making the world a better place you know, just something that we all like value, that's gonna change the world in a fundamental way, like fundamental. And so I really care about that. I mean, like, I love that we're trying to do this regenerative, you know, uh, ag uh, and organic uh, certification on some level, but then the reality, I mean, I'm the son of a state politician, you know what I mean? So I know political footballs when I see them. Yeah, and so I, I just I just can't like you know put any like weight on any of that because it already you know people are, are are you know having all these concerns, and so I really just want want it to stay open as a term that everyone can be like oh yeah well you know picking up trash at the beach is regenerative, you know what I mean and it's like and then we're taking it in and we're recycling it and now they're making toys or like they're making medical th- you know jewelry, everything. I know everything, I anything. I mean, that, that was something that I learned when I was filming the advanced permaculture student online was Eddie Garcia was like, well, if we just had the plastic sorted, it's like, there's a huge proportion you can just heat back up and then like make GI Joe's out of it for kids to play with or whatever you want, you know? And it's like, oh, wow. It's just that normal. And, and we need to, and that's regenerative thinking, right? It's like, well, how do we like capture this energy and like keep its use or, or, or recycle it in a way that leads us on into the future? Not, you know, not having those things go, go somewhere where, where, where they cause harm, um, keeping them in the system while we, while we get better at, at, at turning them into other things. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right? right. That's right. But, but, but with the soil in specific, um, we're talking about organic, I mean, all right, so let me get a visual. So the thing is, I like boiling things down um, 
and and don't mind my my notes. I write all over my books. I I, I, I like to think about like what I could have done better all the time. I'm a teacher, you know. Get out the red pen, right? <laughs> so, um, I consider regenerative soil from these perspectives. You need to have the right minerals, the right biology, uh, the right organic matter, the right plant roots, and photosynthesis, uh, and air and water. And when those things are are all together, when those things are in in coherence that's that's when we really have soil that gets better and better every year yeah and so you're like well okay what does that pra pragmatically mean I, and again I'll, I, this is this is very very direct and, and straightforward um we need all the different levels of organic matter not just like organic matter right so we need the long-term stable forms, but we also need, you know, the, the soluble forms. And then we also need the exchangeable forms. Like, right, we need things to be cycling and also have a long-term savings plan in there. And, 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 and I'll, I'll circle back to that as I start connecting things, but, but soil biology, so much of us, so much of the talk for the past, uh, you know, 10 years has been about compost. We need compost tea, we need compost microbes, we need the right microbes, but it's more than that. Because if it was just compost, I mean, farmers would be like, oh, well, let's get, get, get the compost tea, you know, to get my peas nodulating. They don't do that. Mm -hmm. You need rhizobia. You inoculate those things. So compost doesn't have them. Yeah. So <laughs> The whole of the many parts, yeah. Right, right. But but rhizobia is just one. A another one that recently, you know, in the past decade came to us was mycorrhizae. It's like, of course. You know what I mean? You're not going to get mycorrhizae from a thermophilic process. So the right soil biology, and there's there's a bunch more. Um, there's biology that goes up inside the plant and lives there too. So it's really important that all of these actors and players are included. And then the minerals. You know, it's like Led Zeppelin, Robert Plant, right? Like mountains flow into the sea, right? It's like, so this erosion has been going on from time immemorable. And yes, tillage agriculture, chemical, synthetic chemical agriculture has sped that up because it's like biochar. Like when you add charcoal to something, it sucks up the humus. These purified minerals, these synthetic minerals, they're made out of organic compounds, nitrogen, you know, uh, you know, carbon, phosphorus, all these things, they're part of our bodies. That's why yeah. we want to eat them. That's why plants eat them. And, and so they want to bond with things when they're purified, just like that biochar does. And so it would strip the mineral and strip the organic matter. And that's what's killing the soil. Mm. And, and, and the microbes, they're the ones that are releasing the right minerals and, and, and nutrients because I mean, when you get down to the nutrient levels, they, they're, 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 they're collections of elements. And they're the ones really seeing it in the forms, the exact forms that the plants want, the exact times. So, so, so it's, it's this incredible ballet that happens. The organic matter is where a lot of these minerals are stored. The organic matter is where the uh, soil biology lives and stores energy. And then plant roots, they're conducting energy down and putting these sugars they're sending protons down, H plus. And they're also, you know, when they're stressed, they're doing hydroxides, which is which aren't good. But but they're pumping out energy from photosynthesis and sugars from photosynthesis. And it's that relationship that is so critical. It's actually more than compost when you when when they actually look at it, because they bring the soil organic matter in the form that's proper. And at the highest levels of plant health, the, the plants actually return lipids fats they're returning the highest energy storage unit that we know of mm. back to the soil and, and and when we think about like rain washing things away not 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 like the lipids and the colloids right so so it's truly amazing and then we circle back finally to air and water right well if you've got fourth phase water that water is going to be holding there it's going to be holding things together creating structure and allowing mobility to conduct nutrients microbes and more and then air you know, how are they, you know, fixing nitrogen? Well, it's from the interstitial spaces. 
<laughs> interstitial spaces. That is hard to say. So it's this overlap of all these things together, just having enough aeration, having enough water, not too much, not too little. And all these things together and your soil will get better and better and better because the plant roots will continue to bring down carbon from the air and exude it into the soil and energy from photosynthesis and water, right? Cause it's hydrolysis really that releases the H, H, uh, the H plus the proton and the organic matter will continue to build. The soil biology will be fed and will continue to grow and the minerals will continue to be unlocked because, you know, despite their saying peak phosphorus is around the corner, there's phosphorus like everywhere. Yep. So, though in Australia, you know, zinc and uh, cobalt and, and other things are deficient. So it's, it's really, it's in, in overcropped areas. This is also true, mm. but, but it's, it's really important to note that like compost doesn't have everything we need to bring in some of those minerals slowly and carefully because just like adding a ton of compost to unstructured soil you're gonna have a lot of stuff leach away we need to incorporate these things as the biology can structure them yes yes and i love i love how you've explained that and articulated and i just want to say that that diagram did you ever watch the cartoon captain planet oh my word it's of like it's, yeah but so many people don't mind. know that's right we are Captain Captain Planet. Planet. <laughs> i play that sometimes to hype me up and um, my team calls me captain planet as well sometimes which is nice never shared that but um but it, it, it's, like, it's, it's like all our powers combined it was like the water and the minerals and and all that diagram just really made me take go back to my childhood and um and, 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 and combine all those powers. And it is when we come together and understand it, that it really makes sense. And the, 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 the fact that like spending some time with different soil scientists and agronomists and people who look at soils, you know, sometimes having a high reading of a mineral or, or, or a particular result isn't a good thing. Like excessive is also bad. And sometimes exactly. what's there isn't available to the plant just because it's there. doesn't mean the plant has all the tools there to bring it up. And your point of the roots giving as much as they take, I think roots probably give more than what they take. You know, this hot, this schooling mindset that roots take from the ground and create the tree. And really that is not the way that nature works. The tree's taking so much stuff in from the, from the air and putting gifts into the soil that helps the, my, the, the underground world survive and thrive. And your, your explanation of that, um, does it, you know, does it just so perfectly. And what I get super excited, the more I start learning about this wonderful world under our feet. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it, it really depends on, on the plan or the ratio of what they take versus what they give. Uh, I've heard it said that corn is 50, 50, and then over 94, 96, I can't remember which one, uh, but it's well over 90%. It's in the mid range of 90% um, of the corn's body the above ground physical form is made out of air. Yeah, crazy. So, and it's, I'm not saying like molecules are mostly just space. No, 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 no. No, I mean, it's literally made out of carbon from the air. So when they go through with glyphosate and desiccate it and, and they're gassing off the nutrients in it, they're gassing off a lot of the carbon, it's desiccating it. So the, the, the yeah, there's a huge amount of carbon. Corn actually takes down 400 times the amount of atmospheric increase in CO2 every season. So, so like these plants are just working overtime for us. They have incredible powers. And when we go to that higher level, when they start giving fats, like, like uh, start giving lipids back, they are literally investing in the future at that point. They're like, we did so well, I'm gonna start giving you gold back. You know what I mean? And it's like gold bullion. And it's this long-term carbon sequestration pathway that has only been uh, noticed more recently because mm -hmm. we've got healthier soils to study. Yeah. So that's what I was saying. It's like, we're, learn we're in a learning stage now where you know pioneers like Elaine Ingham, pioneers like the Rodale Institute, um, like, like farming secrets, um, Cole Sice, 
um, all these people have have opened a door and now that we're able to study good examples we're seeing different things boom and it, it, yeah yeah. And, and that's one thing that blew my mind is when I started seeing the content that Farming Secrets captured 10 years ago, and we've spent time with a lot of the experts that you've mentioned. And I go, yeah. what are we doing? What are we waiting for? Like, <laughs> why is this content out there for like 10, 12, 13 years? And, uh, and now <clears throat> we're starting to see more case studies. And it really blows my mind when we survey people, how many people need to see the results? You know, we still have a underlying number of people who say, does this work? Will it be financially stable? Like, how do you prove it? And, and there's so many doubts of people needing to see results. And I think, well, if you just Google it, you'll see all these case studies of people who are regenerating their, their, their soils. There's documentaries mm. on Netflix. There's, you know, well, so uh, many yeah. things, you know. I think a lot of it comes to reading comprehension, though. I think yeah. that, um, you know, uh, one of the things you were asking, like, uh, you know, or, or one of the things that came up was, you know, why are we, why ha we should be doing this now? We should, we should have been doing it earlier. I think that like, there's this like fear that we constantly used to live in. Mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of fear. And so, and there was a lot of ignorance. There was a lot of like misinformation. And now we're getting ahead. We're connecting. We're seeing the positive we're realizing how powerfully bad fear is. And so because of that, we're now being like, wow, we're like holding up the bars on our own cage. Why didn't we realize this before? And we're like, oh, there were these outliers who were like crying out in the wilderness being like, hey, you're doing this wrong. And when we just kept going. And one of the arguments was like, oh, no, no, no. It was business as usual, you know, or, or uh, things were good, so we didn't notice, or did, you know all that stuff. But but I think it. I think you know, in the context of, of America, all those people that returned, all those adults were, were had PTSD, like realistically. Like why was the fifties the fifties PTSD? Yeah. And so you have a lot of people who are like structure, like by the numbers, don't think about things much. Like, yeah. like these, this is a generation that suffered an intense mm. amount. Mm. Um, recently, I heard people say like, well, when you look at Henry Kissinger as someone who like felt like, like his, he, he and his whole family was almost exterminated because they almost were. And so it's like, ooh, oh man, what an injured person. You know what I mean? And I mean, so many of us not like, you know, doing uh, any excuses uh, for his actions or anything, but so many of us are like like that, where we're coming out of like a hard time, not just COVID, but so many of us in our lives, our understanding of things. When I discovered permaculture, it was it was the end of anxiety at a high level for me. It was like, oh, I don't need to, I don't need to watch the news and like freak out because I know better than they do now. Yeah. And, and it was this, whoo, whoo, all right, we can, t we can do this. Yep. And, and, and I think that we, we really are at, that, at a point now where we mentally can take on these things without going, a panic, where's the panic button? Because we're actually at a place where, yeah, there is relative abundance. Yeah, I know there's shortages, you know what I mean? But we also know how to farm properly now. And we all know, we know about permaculture and agroecology and localization. So, so we have the pieces, like, like we literally have the pieces. And I, and I think that that's the biggest game changer for me. Um, I think we started with the, like, what is it? What is regenerative? <laughs> this, this conversation has gone exactly where it needs to go. I'm very, um, very, I'm very grateful of your time and what you're sharing. And I, I just find so much comfort in your, you know, sharing that so many people are changing and, and empowering themselves to do things a bit differently. And that's one of the things that I realized so recently as well is that more and more people going, I know what they're saying, but this way of farming feels better. This excites me to get on my farm or in my paddock or into my garden and know that I'm around less chemicals. I don't have to stress about where the next money's gonna come from to pay the input bill that someone's telling me that if I do X, it will equal Y. And years after years, it's kind of showing that there's diminishing returns. 
and that's degenerative and degrading of our soul and our spirit and the quality of the food and nutrition. And so I, I love that so many people see those virtual prison bars as you kind of created that, that cage and going, oh, they're just made up. I can move forward to what feels right. And I want to go down in <clears throat> our permaculture. I want to go syntropic. I want to go whatever you do above the ground, but it's with the mindfulness and the intention of what's happening below the ground. And then that yeah. is where the transformation. And that's why regenerative to me is an inside job. It starts at the human level, the paradigm shifts, which you mentioned at the start of this um, about seeing the world and looking at even permaculture and that changing your paradigm. And now all of a sudden there wasn't that news article and the panic response. There is this hang on, I see what's happening here. Oh, there's the other side of the coin and, oh, there's the edge as well. And it's like, oh, you know, there's so much more to explore when you change your paradigm and your mindset. And, uh, you know, I want to check in with the audience that are watching us live. And if you're on the podcast, you know, maybe think about the question that I'm about to ask, but share something that's kind of blown your mind that you now know about soil that you didn't know 20 minutes ago, um, you know, sharing with Matt and hanging out here and, and, and exploring this wonderful world of soil and regenerative, what's something that kind of blew your mind that you didn't really know of, or something that you're going to get more curious about and go and explore and feel free to share this video into other Facebook groups. Cause the more people who watch this and we can inoculate our planet to uh, learn this new way of thinking about soil, it's not even new. It's, it's traditional. It's been here since, you know, nature started. So, uh, and if you're on the podcast, think about who you, needs to hear this conversation and make sure that you're sharing uh, the love around uh, the love of our soil. Matt, I know that you've got lots of educational products and you, your education spirit is definitely high. And, and you said you're passionate about educator, but I will put a little asterisk there and say you're passionate about everything that, that saves the planet. Cause I've seen the content that you do and you're always busy and, and uh, producing some amazing quotes and all your graphics are, are awesome. Um, have you, did you work on all those graphics yourself? Like the, are you the artist, like writer, are you the, 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 the generalist that does it all, or do you have a team behind you? I, okay, so for the permaculture student one and for the permaculture student two, I had uh, two artists. And no, there's a third artist, so three artists. And I grew up drawing. And so I was drawing drawings for them to, to spruce up. And when I came to regenerative soil, I was like, I can't do it again. Because I, I knew how many revisions it was going to take just by looking at the, like, like I was looking at like 40 papers and I was like, wow. So there's like a lot here. And I like, like, I just was like realizing like I was going to have an evolution and, and like, I would have to draw it over and over again myself. So it's like, you know, you just got to figure this out. And I'd done it as a kid. And so I just started uh, drawing on the computer and I just figured it out. So the pictures, all the photography is me. Uh, the pictures of me are, are my my wife doing it or my son. And uh, yeah, I do everything myself. I do all the writing, all the like technical, all, I do everything myself. I love that because it's like the connectivity. Like I see you share these these diagrams on on your Instagram and your Facebook, and they make sense. You know, there's a visual aid to the complexity because I think sometimes, even mentioning some of the words that you've mentioned during this podcast, it can be a bit daunting and it can be a little bit overwhelming. Going, wow, I can't think of all these terminologies and how they connect, and plus this and minus that, and at, so knowing the complexity of the soil, like what's a low hanging fruit unintended that people can do like today, tomorrow in their backyard, on their paddocks, on their farm, in their mindset that can get them thinking soil first and regenerative and, 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 and not get stuck on the complicated words that I can't even pronounce. <laughs> we'll okay. Well, number one, we are, uh, we are often dealing with soils that either are getting too hot or too wet. So drainage is an issue, and then, and then not you know, being able to hold water is an issue. Biochar helps with both of those things. And the wild thing is, biochar can hold up three times its mass in water. So on those hard years, oh my word, it's going to hold water much longer. You're going to have to use less water. I mean, if you do, you know, 
10% of your soil profile suddenly, like let's say you mix in uh, as, you're, as you're building your soil, you're establishing a site, you do 30% biochar and you can do this, absolutely. Uh, tests show that up to 85%, there's the plants grow healthily just fine. So, which is wild. Most people don't know that. Um, and so if you did 10% of your soil profile in biochar, that would hold as if it was 30%. It's three times its mass. So it's like unbelievable. So, so, so you have this huge increase in water and then biochar is bio, right? Bio charcoal. And so that means you can inoculate it before. And, you know, and I say inoculate it, not just compost. Oh, there we go. My phone alarm. Um, but not just compost, compost is great, but compost is also a medium for biology. So this is your opportunity for your mycelium to develop. So mycorrhizal inoculants, you could be adding as well biofertilizers of all sorts, free living and root associated and endophytic. So you can, and, and, and the reason I know that it's cool is because I've done the research these things that are endophytic, you know, how are they given to you? Like you can buy in a store in a stable little bag, like you put them in your compost or your biochar, like they suddenly disappear. They don't know, no. I mean, if they're in a stable form in the bag, you know what I mean? They're gonna persist. That's why there's expiration dates on these things. Mm -hmm. Usually the microbes last without a host for over a full year which makes sense. So if they miss a season, those microbes that are in the soil, endophytes, free living and soil associate and, so, and root associated, they'd still be there. Yes. You know, so, so add everything to the, this, this charcoal, add, you know, add the compost, get it, get it so ready. So charge, maybe you're, you add your soluble kelp at this point, you know, your rock dust, go crazy and and then add that in and it's going to hold those things much much better than it just adding it on top especially and just adding them alone the biochar is that magnet mm -hmm. um, because it's purified carbon not purely purified it's like 90 percent pure carbon okay it's not pure carbon you know what i mean pure things are hard to come by and that's why the synthetic <laughs> stuff the synthetic <laughs> chemicals were so like crazy because nature's like what is this and it's like you know so so i would say the biggest win is to do pre-loaded biochar additions to your soil because it helps it drain but it's also filtering the water that comes through for for the nutrients right because i mean rain there's thunder and lightning i mean there's nitrogen now in that rain so, so there's a lot of good stuff and there's also biology. That's what forms clouds they discovered. So, so much going on, but it all gets locked up in that tiny little package that is now like a, a seed ball, you know what I mean, of life, but microbially, and you're just sending that out. So that's, that's what I would say is the biggest encapsulated win. I love that. And and I think that's, you know, even just your way of explaining that, it's like just pick one thing and 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 focus on that and monitor that. Um and 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 because it can get overwhelming, like exploring the 12 different principles of regen ag and all these other different frameworks. It's like, no, I think I want to explore this. And I, you know, I I recently am buying a microscope because I'm so curious about looking at that life in our soil, you know, like maybe, maybe just educating yourself and watching a bit of different programming you know different different things instead of watching netflix watch a video I, listen to an audio book buy a book you know educate i think that works for like design the whole like the 12 steps of this the 12 principles of this but it doesn't work that way for soil soil is nature it's yeah. not design that's it's right. like we need to sit down and like look at what nature's trying to tell us and then be like okay i can dance like this and like this, but if I go like this, I'm gonna headbutt it and it's gonna hurt me. It's like, yes, yes. You've been, we've been headbutting the wall 
for like 200 years. Well, <laughs> technically like 10,000, depending on where you are in the world. But, um, but, but for real though, it's like, we need to look at these things so that we actually can see what nature's doing because I t- that, 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 that overlap is real on so many levels. It's like, well, the plant roots, they're putting out protons, you know, electrons, but they're also putting out sugars, right? So there's chemistry happening. There's, you know, bioelectricity happening. There's, you know what I mean? There's so many things happening all at once. All these things are deeply connected and we can, very elegantly like as children participate and rock this and so it's really fun to go micro to macro and go back and forth but at the same time it's so so basic so simple um when when you can look at it and that's why my, my stuff is so visual because i really wanted to get out of the way instead of like telling people what to do or what's right i want people to see it yeah and then they could they could start creating new new methods too from it which is yeah. already starting to happen love that and i can tell you're visual and uh we were both dancing then when you're talking about the dancing so if you're on the podcast listening if you head over to our soillearningcenter.com you can watch the video version of these podcasts because that's where the best experience lies um but uh, if you're listening along we really love to thank you for being a soil lover listener and uh i wanted to uh, ask you our signature question, which we ask mm. all our guests on the show, which is if you were this voice of our soils, what would you tell us on planet earth? Mm. Let's be the voice of our soils. I think the voice of the soil would, would honestly sound a lot like the, um, the indigenous and Aboriginal leaders um, in, in how we need to like, slow down mm. and 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 recognize again who we are in the ecosystem and the holistic world because we've got um i mean on the whole not us individually so don't you know don't <laughs> take offense but what we're doing it's like we got a lot of nerve um to be honest, what we've done is like horrific. Mm. And so, I mean, the soil is, 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 is on the ropes. I mean, it's going extinct. It's being so, but it's noble. I, and that's why I, I think of those, you know, those Aboriginal leaders and indigenous leaders, um, because it's, I mean, we owe everything to soil and a culture that doesn't respect the soil doesn't respect itself. Great. And so it's, it's, it's like that, or it's like a mother, you know, and I'm a dad, so I can't like do the mom thing perfectly, but, but it's like a disappointed mother because soil has provided everything like this earth has provided everything and we just took advantage we, st- we it's like it's like humanity stole money from from mama's wallet yep and she knew and let it happen because she loved us so much mm-hmm. but we were that bad kid you know, I get emotional thinking about this because that's what it is. You know what I mean? And and so we really need to like bring this back and realize that like all of our health, our kids, our grandkids, the future of all of our families, it's all tied up in that soil. So, so for me, I, I mean, hard to answer that question it's a really no, but i think you've done a beautiful job and i think that you know you started off with that slow you know and i think that's we live in a culture now where everything's fast bigger better faster you know whatever 10x this and 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 we just need to slow down and observe and listen and watch and 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 have the finger on the pulse and the rhythm and you know we've lost that connectivity to it all and um i think you know even when you were ex- explaining 
that and you were the voice of our soil, you, you know, my mind showed images of our, you know, first nation people caring for the soil. All that memory is in the soil and it is holding on to that hope that it will get back to that stage. And, you know, the soil doesn't forget, it just keeps on providing. And we are getting to that point where we, we are creating a worrying tipping point of the soils becoming past that tipping point and on the verge of, of, of extinction. And, and, and this is why this gives me so much hope because just the more I converse with people, I don't have to live in this doom and gloom world. I can see all the amazing projects that people are working on and the, um, yeah. you know, the, the solutions that are being presented. So I, I love that. And, um, and, and I don't, I don't want to knock Netflix as one of the people in the comments has said is I think Netflix has got an amazing amount of um, documentaries. So it should be more clear on that and go, you know, be selective with what you watch on these different platforms. Cause even on YouTube and even on any platform, you can get, you know, down the rabbit hole of the wrong content. Um, but you've got to have that filter and be selective. And so, um, I, I think that's, um, um, uh, that is great. Awesome. We're going to jump into some Q&A questions and this is like the bonus part. So Matt, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast and I've really loved digging deeper into the wonderful world of soil. Now we're not going to wrap up for the live audience, but we're going to wrap up for the podcast version of this. So Matty, what, how can people hang out with you more and, uh, you know, get to download your knowledge and your brain? I believe you've got a course coming out as well soon. Yeah. Yeah. So I have taken this book and gone through section by section and turned them into videos where I dive deeper. And then I've created audio, I'm creating audiobook version of this as well. I'm so excited. Um, and it's actually a slightly newer edition of this for, for the course release. Uh, because as I said, in the past few months, things have changed even. We we're getting new discoveries. And I've also talked and interviewed and gone to visit and filmed the, the folks that inspired this, the actual scientists, the actual farmers, the actual researchers. And I've been able to gather all that together to create a course that has a weekly live Q&A so that we can go through this. Because like you said, it, it's complicated, but at the same time, it turns into very simple uh, and clear actions. And when you have that clarity of understanding each of the lenses and you put them together it, there's nothing like it. You instantly know what you need to do and it opens up all these new possibilities for how you can do it. Uh, we're, it's a game changer. And so I'm really excited about it. We'll be going through weekly this the, for 16 weeks. So <laughs> not much uh, it's not gonna be overwhelming. We're, that's, why, that's why we're taking so much time so awesome. that everyone's included, everyone keeps up. We're live every uh, Saturday or Friday uh, for Q and A so that everyone gets their questions answered. Uh, and, and then we can apply it to our actual sites and our actual soils. There are some incredible examples in that book, in the course and in the world newly emerging that you know maybe they're listening right now and, and, and they're just starting out, but people are figuring it out. They're realizing that it's the soil that determines the, the health of the food the health of the animals that eat that food and the health of the people that eat that, those plants or those animals. And so it all starts with soil and it all ends with soil. So we have to start respecting soil and working with it. Amen to that. Thank you so much, Matt. And uh, for those listening on the podcast, thank you for joining us for another episode of Secrets of the Soil. You've been digging deeper with Matt and Regen Ray, and we're so excited for you to be on this journey with us. If you want the extended bonus version, head over to www.soillearningcenter.com where you can get free access to the extended version. Um, with that, Matt, we're going to keep digging deeper on the bonus part of this, which is with our live audience on Facebook. This is a first time for me, so I'm kind of winging it. And I don't even know the script sometimes. So you're hearing a raw and unedited version of this. So it's super fun. And I see the viewers coming in and out. So if you are here live with us today, we're going to jump into some Q&A. And so I thank everyone who's been uh, popping comments along the way. I didn't address them during the podcast because it doesn't really create a great experience for someone listening to a podcast. I was just mindful of which part of content is going to go to where. And so 
I, you know, Matt, people have been commenting on how amazing your smile is. I overlooked that and I probably should have said that on the podcast, but you know, that could have been the link to come and to see us, see you on the Soil Learning Center. Um, so I, I, one of the comments that was here was about peer pressure. Um, and I guess it's, you know, one of the things I realized with um, people transitioning or moving into a more regenerative mindset is that kind of aloneness feeling and being a bit isolated in their, in their community. Um, how, how do you overcome that peer pressure? And like, do you, like, how do you get so confident in what you're doing that you let the neighbors not, you know, worry you anymore? Cause I feel like that's a very big thing. Maybe here more in Australia, we have a tall, tall poppy syndrome, people are less confident to just charge forward and stand their ground. Um, okay. Number yeah. one, we are the people we surround ourselves with, right? So if you are around low energy people, it's going to be low energy for you for the most part. If you're around high energy, high performance, um, like the winners, you're going to be naturally pulled up. Yeah. And so uh, I would say I, you have a community, right? You, yeah. Farming <laughs> Secrets has a community. Yep. This is a community of farmers that get together, that share their secrets, that help each other. There's, that, there's a similar thing in, in America if you sign up for both and, 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 and you meet even more people, Kind Harvest, John yeah. Kempf, of he's, I mean, John Kempf is, is, is all about collecting as many case studies as possible. Um, and, and I would say he's just on a mission really to help farmers individually and it's his business. Mm -hmm. So he's selling them the, the regenerative ag inputs, the chelated minerals, the, the biology, the mycorrhizae, and so, and he's doing the testing. So he's got the actual results and, and it's stunning what we've been able to see and, and, and realize. So Kind Harvest is an incredible community. I think it's $7 a month. Uh, it's something very affordable, incredible. Everyone should check it out. Mm -hmm. um, Farming Secrets and another incredible, everyone should check that out too. You guys are amazing. Uh, we did the golden ticket giveaway with our future with you all. Love that. Yeah, we have lots of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, and so I, I would say those are farmer communities. And being, and in my course, I have gardeners, I have farmers, I have horticulturists, I have cannabis growers, I have the full spread of uh, uh, people. And I really like to go micro, micro to macro have people have a fluency so that if they wanted to go into horticulture, they could, or if they wanted to go into to composting, they could, but to have that fluency that they can go anywhere and rock it. So, and like, of course, there's like, you know, Dr. Laningham's like microscope, uh, microscope classes and everything. Um, so there's, there's a lot of communities that will give you the confidence that you need wherever you're at. Um, and all of those are gonna feel a little different. You know, like mine's gonna feel a little different than John's. Um, yours is gonna feel a little different from, from, from all of ours too. And and it that's why it's so great because we're gonna reach different people mm -hmm. and we're gonna and, and people are gonna find a home and they're gonna find friends and they're gonna be like, listen, you're two hours away, but but we're friends now. You mm -hmm. know. <laughs> I'm calling you up every week and we're going to be talking about ourselves, you know, absolutely. And, and it's these relationships that give us the confidence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, sometimes it's just like reading a Joel Saladin book for someone and they're like, no, I can do it, you know, but, but for most of us, we need to be around other people. I, I go to high performance um, events. I go to, uh, you know, Brendan Burchard is, yeah, I totally. love Brent Richard. I read all his books. <laughs> I go to his events. I bring my son. I get special permission to bring my son. And so I I love being around people that love to grow, that mm -hmm. love to challenge themselves, that want to go to the next level in life. Yep. And so and so yeah, I mean get find the one that resonates with you. Mm -hmm. You gotta Excited. find your tribe. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And I love what you mentioned there about too, about cross-pollinating, you know, like in this group, I learned this and I'm sharing it to another group. And 
that that is that's where the momentum of you know magicalness happens, where you get to cross pollinate and share wisdom and 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 give and take, you know, and 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 yeah, it's it. I definitely agree. Like hanging around like minded people is uh, is a game changer, and and definitely and. Unfortunately, with COVID, it's not all physical world anymore, but, you know, definitely a lot of energy can be transferred in situations like this, hanging out in the right webinars, in the right rooms, Zoom. You know, there's so many platforms now where you can just hang out with cool, you know, cool people, like-minded um, tribe people, you know, find your tribe. We call them soil lovers. And uh, so much so that we, 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 we launch a whole new platform called Soil Learning Center, which I've been banging on about. And we're so excited about that because we're bringing a lot of that connectivity features into our own platform. You know, a lot of people wanting to move away from Facebook. A lot of people want to, you know, not knowing who's listening where and, you know, all this other, uh, you know, YouTube people's videos are getting removed and so forth. So we've got to be careful about where we're putting content and what we're saying and how do we continue to have that voice of our truths and being able to, to, to share that. And so we're bringing a lot of that in-house, I guess, into our Soul Learning Center and what we call Soul TV, which will be our new kind of platform for YouTube videos. Um, because yeah, we, we've, we've had a couple of our videos where we might talk about the keyword healing. It's like, that's demonized now. It's like, you're not allowed to say something heals. And it's like, really? Like, it's crazy what the world we're living in. So, and here we are broadcasting on Facebook, but you know, I feel like our time is limited to continue sharing this, this information and um, you know, depends who gets to control the narrative, you know, at the end, I think everyone is realizing that maybe there are people dialing, you know, turning dials to make more of this narrative be more prominent, you know, in your face rather than the other. So, so yeah, we're excited about that whole community aspect and bringing people into a platform where they can connect to each other and see each other on a map and be like, Oh my God, we're a couple of hours away. Let's do a road trip. Let's visit each other's farms. And, you know, we've got years and years of virtual farm tours for that reason. Cause we always wanted to be that bridge between here, we'll take you on a virtual farm tour so you don't have to drive kilometers and come out and see it, you know? So um, we, we still do that. And I have a lot of fun and meet that, uh, meet people that way as well. So, um, so your, 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 uh, the other question that I wanted to um, address here was like your analogy about um, stealing from a mother was awesome. And how long can we allow that? Like, where is enough enough? Like, do, do you feel that there is a bit of a time frame that we still have up our sleeves or have we gone beyond that tipping point and we really need to like start backpedaling? Um, well, okay. So the, 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 the global perspective on too far is, is impossible to say. Mm -hmm. I've looked at the research forward and backward and I know there's constantly new things coming out. I, I get that, yep. but we can't predict the, the grand scale of things. What we can say is the most degraded and unsuitable soils and landscapes can be turned into arable soil and water holding transformed landscapes that inspire, you know, stir the heart. And, and I think that when we see like the work of Neil Speckman in with the Albeda project in Saudi Arabia, and we see you go from desert to, to rolling, rolling fields of grasses, Ah, I get chills. It just, it, it, it I mean, it, we, we think back to biblical times of when that place was turned into a desert, the time of Abraham, right? In the Bible, like that was the fertile crescent not being fertile anymore. <laughs> like that's, that's what that was. And so uh, it's like, this is the moment that we fix it. Whoa. So powerful. It's so deep. It touches all of our stories. And, and so, and in, in China, it's the Lost Plateau, they've proven it. And, uh, you know, Africa, it's Sahara Desert, and they've proven it in small places and small plots. But it's this, it's, it's truly inspiring what we can, what we can do. And so, um, 
Yeah, I think that I think that if we if we look at the individual examples that are the worst case scenarios, we see we can do this. We can pull back from from what looks like desolation. Mm -hmm. And nature is ready and willing to heal, to come back, to regenerate. Okay. And and as as we've seen in 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 in, in history. After every great extinction, there's an explosion of life. Well, not everything dies in these great extinctions. So we we don't have to die. Nothing more has to die. Like we could start this, we could start this party now, you know, and bring it all back online. And so I I, I really feel like that's where we need to look and, and be inspired by if you look into how they calculate the numbers on everything, it gets so screwy. Um, if we want to measure carbon, we measure it in the soil and in the photosynthetic capacity of the earth. We don't do it through CO2. Think about this. We've destroyed the soil. The majority of soil, uh, like 30 to 50% of soil is fungi. If we've killed the fungi and fungi exhales soil, like uh, fungi exhales CO2, just like we do. In a, and and we lose that much and they're going to be exhaling way more co2 so what's really going on here is the photosynthetic capacity of the earth needs to be in situ with those the the, the fungi and what happens is that it never reaches the ice cores in situ carbon release because carbon is heavier than oxygen Oxygen goes up and CO2 falls. So all the exhalation of CO2 by animals would fall. And I know in the heat, you know what I mean? Heat rises. So if you're in a cold climate, it'll go up at first. But if you watch long enough in the moisture and it's cold enough out, you actually see it go back down. Mm -hmm. so, so CO2 actually falls. It's a heavier molecule when you think about it, it makes sense. And so it would fall on all the plants and it would be intercepted by all the plants above it. So we actually, the CO2 thing isn't gonna help us when we start fixing things. It's the, but in the soil we can measure it and it's awesome and that's the right place to measure it, right? Cause that's where it's actually sunk. That's where we're putting the money in the bank. So, so that, that's what I would say to that. So it's, it's difficult to go from that perspective especially when 90% of you know climate change or global warming you know greenhouse gas effect is actually soil is actually moisture and that can be trapped in the soil so um, water vapor to be specific uh, so so we we can do all these things we can turn these things around it is not it is not yet too late but we need to act really fast because all that being said, the actual things that I'm looking at, like the fact that like the kelp forests of the earth are dying and like the oceans are warming. So photosynthetic capacity, of the oceans are dropping. That's where half or more of the oxygen comes from. Mm -hmm. And then, and then the soil is our health. So some things, 97% of the nutrition has disappeared from that food category in the past 50 years because of the soil. It, it just sucks. So it can't grow anything. You know what I mean? It can't, can't grow nutrient dense food. So, so I really feel like we need to just focus on healing the actual watersheds and soils and photosynthetic capacity, like in other words, the, the forests and the plants and the grasslands, bringing those back. And we're gonna see the world heal. We're gonna see wild fluctuations of weirdness in CO2, but it's gonna be cyclical and tied to the seasons. So it won't be like, the, it won't be like, it won't be like they're talking about um, in, that, in terms of the healing process. Um, though th there's, this is why in Drawdown, Paul talks about like, if we got rid of all the smoke all at once, it would actually not be good because we'd get more UV radiation mm. and then it would heat up even in fact, there's all these different things. So if we do it the right way, we're creating cover for shade, we're trapping more moisture in the ground. 
it actually touches and touch, uh, touches and fixes everything. Sorry, I, about the tangent. <laughs> I love it. I just think it's it. important to understand. Yeah. I just really think it's important to understand that like, it's, it's, we are not doomed. We got some messes we need to clean up and we need to honor our ancestors and honor very specific cultures that have done things right that we like destroyed, buried, you know, all these different things. There's a lot that needs to happen. Yep. Yep. But we've got our we've got our marching orders. We got the road plan. We got the path. We've got the solutions. And it's and it's healing and it's gonna be awesome. Love that. And I'm really mindful of your time. So let us know when we need to kind of wrap up a little bit. One of the other questions that is sitting here on you're, you're good? I love lives. I don't know if you notice. Oh, I've seen. <laughs> you know, well, there's a, there's a different thing when we're live, actually. Yeah. I love being live. And I think it's because it feels like I'm actually with a classroom of students. I feel like we're, we're actually together and I'm actually helping people. Like yep. when it's just the camera, sometimes it's like, you know, I got to like try to motivate, you know, but like this, this is the best. So I love I'm loving it. I love live to do. It's uh, the best way to get to, for me to get content out. And I feel like when we are in those like live situations or panel talks, it's more from the heart and not the head. You know, I feel like having slides and all that's all over curated sometimes. And it's a bit of a head presentation where I'm more about like what comes from the heart. Sometimes I finish these things and I don't even remember what I said because it's just uh-huh. so me in flow from the heart out of the voice. And I, I just don't know, you know, it's just coming intuitively and, uh, and, and, uh, and I love it. It fires me up as well. Um, I know you're wrapping up the day, but this is firing up my day. Like I know I'm going to be more productive after doing something like this. So hopefully, you can see. Uh, but financial failure is one of the big things that people worry about. They think, oh, I'm going to change this on my farm. I've done it this way for six generations. I'm following my grandfather's and great grandfather's ways of farming. And they're just worried that if they change through this, it's going to be like financial ruin for them. What do you say about that? Like, uh, like I know sometimes people see drop in yields and they see, you know, changes in their grow patterns and their, their, their profitability on the first couple of years, but long-term and mindset, what, what do you say about people who are concerned about financial ruin by changing to a more natural way? Okay. Yeah. So what I suggested, right. With the biochar and all that, that's like a vegetable farmer, right? Right. That's not, that's nowhere in the reality for someone doing wheat right? No, that's never going to happen. But the people doing wheat might inoculate. You know what I mean? Those people might put the biology on. And that that's, that's the that's the big change. I think a lot of us is adding the biology. So so the first thing I would say is that if you've already been doing it a certain way, you need to respect the fact that this is hard. That you're going to naturally not going to want to change. So like acknowledge the fact that like even proposing changing what like your grandfather did is going to be weird and painful. Like just acknowledging that as part of the process that I think is vital. And then l- looking for the least change for the maximum long-term effect, that is, you know, a permaculture principle from David, Mal- uh, David Holmgren. Um, and I think it really pays off financially when you do that on a farm. And so I would number one, do a plant sap analysis of your current crop and run that against your soil test. Cause I know you already did your soil test if you're a farmer, but plant sap analysis, you might not have done run that against each other and see what you're actually missing mm-hmm. and then see what it would cost for the biggest controller. What do I mean by that? So like, if you're like, oh, wow. So I don't have manganese. Um, well, manganese actually uh, is, is is connected and is a controller. It's like your governor on phosphorus. Um, and so, and, and, and then you're like, oh, I have no cobalt. Well, forget about your biology they won't be able to persist because B12 can't form. So actually you might want to focus on, and, and cobalt, you'd need so little 
and cobalt makes all the other things more bioavailable. I think I theorize through making the biology more vibrant. Makes sense. Um, but they haven't made that link yet. Um, so, so I think that you would see things from that perspective, especially if you've got like, you know, like my book is a cipher. My book's a cipher. You look at this cycle, you look at the, the EHPH. Um, let me show you what that looks like. You look at the EHPH and you're like, okay, where am I EHPH? Okay, that's available, but it's showing that this is happening. And then you're like, okay, where am I in the actual cycle? What's going on here? And you start to pinpoint things and come to understanding things in a different way. So I would say that you might, you might find like, holy cow, this is what's going on. I don't have enough of this. And if I do this, yeah, I might still need zinc. But this will make whatever zinc I have there more bioavailable. Next year, I'm going to do zinc. And, 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 and you might do this piecemeal. Because guess what? The soil wants it done slowly anyway. You know, so, so be strategic about it. And then also realize that the foliar sprays are going to save you a lot of money. If, if you can get access to them and if they're affordable to ship to you, of course, but they're so small and they're dried. And so you could be, and, and obviously, you know, there was recommended reverse osmosis water, not, uh, not anything hard or bicarbonate or anything like that. But if you can get, if you can get the right minerals, the right chelated minerals, you can add this as a foliar spray, not even worry about the soil, fix the plants, then the plants are suddenly exuding mm -hmm. properly. And then the soil, it looks as if you added compost inches, like inches deep, but it's actually you getting the plant online. So I would say as a farmer, the number one thing is getting your, your plants and online and your seeds started right. So inoculating your seeds so that you're starting off, uh, you seed coat it in biology uh, and, in, and in nutrition, and then full, like plant, a plant sap analysis in situ while you're going in tandem with, uh, with your soil, like understanding what's in your soil, then using foliar sprays to treat it you're going to see your, your soils improve so fast while you get a better crop, while you get disease resistance and pest resistance. And then you won't need to use pesticides, fungicides, um, or insecticides of any sort, because your plants will be resistant to all that. And so suddenly you're like, okay, well, I'm saving money. I'm not buying that. And as it develops, you're gonna be like, oh, wow, there's more nitrogen being uptaken um, from the biology. And so you, need, you don't need it as much fertilizer because you have biofertilizers, the microbes themselves. And suddenly your bill starts to go down. So first, the, th the first thing that goes down is your, your, your pesticide, your, your, you know, your poisons, right? So suddenly you don't have to worry about, you know, protecting yourself. And then, and then you're like, okay, I'm adding less fertilizer. And, and ideally you're adding fertilizers that are microbially friendly. Cause if you're adding anything synthetic, it's gonna knock you back. Um, and so there's just gonna be this, and, and you know, if at first that's what you're doing, you at least get the get the the pesticides out and then next season you start shifting more and more but start with the poisons start with the low-hanging fruit because it's actually the low-hanging fruit when you're doing foliar sprays i mean it's like a bit of this and a bit of that you know it's like molybdenum so that your nitrogen fixation actually happens because without it it doesn't you know what I mean? Like, like, like these little things, yeah. these micronutrients, you know, maybe you're doing a, a kelp foliar, foliar spray or something, and that's cool. Um, but, but maybe it's later on in the season and, and you don't want it to, uh, to be, be having those certain uh, uh, growth stimulants 
um, the branching stimulants at that time. But, but yeah, I would say look at it and then evaluate. And you can get there very fast um, if you're strategic. Mm. And, and I, I, there are all great um, action items and things. And, and, you know, I think those soil tests like, expanding on that and, um, and, and, and just like there are things that people can do, uh, you know, or they might already be doing stuff. They just need to ask for the advanced soil test, you know, like you might already be doing it, like get the more detailed one, you know, find an agronomist who understands the regenerative model and the regenerative way of soil. Um, and, 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 and one thing that I want to just, you know, from my experience is like sometimes and I probably am a little bit of this type of personality type where I go all in and it's like, I, I find that sometimes farmers go, Oh, tilling is bad. Sell the tractor. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not going to set you up for success. And I think like sometimes this financial failure mindset comes from, Oh, chemicals are bad. I need to throw all the chemicals out and stop using them tomorrow. And you articulated quite well before where soils build a pattern and a rhythm and they're used to a certain way and doing a shock. It's like going and doing a cold bath. If you're used to being in a climate control and everything's 20 degrees Celsius, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, but, and then you go into a cold bath, it's a shock to the system. Now that could be good for some resilience and you know what people have studied about cold baths but our soils react the same like all these massive changes creates a big pattern change or pattern interrupt so we need to wean things off you know that's where that whole weaning kind of things comes from you know i at one point kind of put a video and a rant and a blog together where i was like we need regen rehab where farmers are addicted to the usage of chemicals in the same way as when you are physically addicted to a substance you need to go through a rehab program to wean yourself off the soils and the farmer mindset are somewhat the same. You know, we need to wean that off and understand we can't go cold turkey on all things because that's where it gets a bit more risky and um, can create a lot of, um, you know, yeah, a lot of pattern changes and rhythm changes. But, you know, sometimes when you learn this stuff, it's hard to continue putting inputs into your property when you know the effects, but you're looking for the long term. You know, rocking up to the gym every day is hard too, but you've got the eye on the prize, you know, and we've got to you know, flex that muscle and, and work it all the time and slowly it builds up, you know, and I think that mindset of the farmer and, and people working with soil and growing needs to be somewhat uh, around the same analogies that it's okay to learn something and, and say that this clashes with my values, but you don't have to bin it, you know, three seconds later, you need to learn how to integrate that and, and wean it off. So have you- and There's actually a physical side to it um, because I mean, like, let's bring in like, uh, like a foot of compost because it's not structured, it, it will go anaerobic if it's too thick of a layer, just like it would in a pile when you don't turn it. Mm. So, so we can't have that all organic matter incorporate instantly, like, uh, and, and because it's not structured. And that's why, you know, so often like people add things in and they till it and then it turns into concrete. It's because there was no structure to accept those things and instead it created a new structure and it just created a fine structure <laughs> that's not <laughs> porous, you know what I mean? And so um, I, I, I really think that uh, if we do things properly and biology is encoding everything in, it will build soil structure uh, rapidly, but still at, its, at, at the pace that biology goes at, not our pace. Love that. Well, if you're listening live and you want to ask a question, feel free to pop it into the chat. Um, we'll probably hang around for another little while. Um, what are you sipping on there? See, it looks uh, is there just lemons, lemon water, nice. energy, antioxidant, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. I know. And, 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 and like, just, you know, to your point on that, like, you know, the, the rind and the skin of so many vegetables and fruits have so much nutrients in it. That's the, you know, either thing that's touching the, the air that where it's creating a lot of, you know, minerals and vitamins from and or in the soil, you know? And so like, so I, you know, sometimes people say, oh, how come you don't peel this or you don't peel that? It's like, oh, well, I don't, I don't know how to explain this about the, you know, cause it's like a process to talk to the right person. We spoke about tribe before, like it's so comforting sometimes being in a room where everyone gets it and you just can talk the same language, but you, you know, having the, the tools not to start an argument with someone <laughs> when they want it their way and you want it your way. Um, you they're know, finding out so many of these things are either created by the microbes they are, you know, uh, micro microbial metabolites inside plants or 
they're actually the microbes themselves. And so me medicine, natural medicines are often that we're just eating these microbes that are endophytic to plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, in the more, yeah. And what I love about this space is the more I learn, I can't unlearn it. You know, it's, it's like in my brain, it's in my DNA and, um, you know, <clears throat> putting those, th those principles. And like, I live in an apartment. So for me, it's very limited about some of the things I can physically do in the soil. Um, but I get my fix by seeing what other people as our students, our members are, are going through and what the, their aha moments and going, Oh, I'm part of their journey. You know, that that's really mm. uplifting and amplifying for me. Um, as someone in this space, you know, and, and, and yeah. And so I want to talk a little bit more about the course and I'll just for everyone who's watching us uh, at home, I'll share uh, the screen. So you got a little bit of a visual aid and that uh, link is in the chat. So if you haven't already go over and uh, check it out. Now it says it started in July. I believe you've set the date 26th. Is it yeah. only a live kind of experience or will someone in a year's time who watches this video that we have left online as a gift watching, can they still call to action and go through it at their own pace? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think I'm going to do what I did with the advanced permaculture student online is do it every year again and include awesome. everyone that's in, always been in it. Because what happens when we repeat these things, when we include people, when, when it's a community, is people make deep connections. People uh, have deep insights and the community and and the groups around it really benefit. Yeah, I love that. And, and I think that compounding and refresher, I always love when a course gives me that bonus value or this program to say, come and do it with us again. You know, as a past alumni student, we want you to refresh and compound that learning. And I think it's always really magical when someone's gone through the process. Actually, I'm gonna play my magical music. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> when students become mentors and teachers and um, give back, you know, going through that, that circle of education and being a student and learning. And then a year later being like, oh, I did this. And now I want to share a photo of my paddock or my land or my soil or my, my tests. And they're a product of that, um, of the, of the program. I think that's really, really magical. Um, and I, I do believe that that is what we all should be doing. You know, learn out loud is what I call it. And it's like, learn something and then learn out loud and teach it to someone else. Cause that means that you truly get it. And it uh, comes from a space of, uh, confidence. And if you can get out in the paddock and do it now, it's coming from a space of experience, not knowledge. And so that's the part that I go and do farm tours with and learn with other people. Cause I want to do more experiential learning as well. Um, and I, I hope one day soon we have a physical soil learning center. That's actually a place that people can meet and dig up soil and get their hands dirty in, in a Love physical it. and hopefully post COVID we, we can do that sooner than later. So um, your course, like what's like, so what are some of the key takeaways that people are going to get left with? Well, you're going to learn how to diagnose, how to understand and how to interact, build, restore, regenerate and remediate soil. Wow. So it's a deep dive into the science, but right. it's also a deep dive into the, the pragmatic actions that you can take. And I, I, I link it back to those, those, those five levels that, that connect so that everyone can really gather all that information, fluently understand it, and then make very clear, simple actions for their season for the next five years, for the next 10 years, they'll be able to project out where they want to go, how they want to do it. And, and from the farm level down to the garden scale, or even the large restoration scale, we can partner with soil and make the world a better place at the same time. Ooh, I love that. I love that partnering with soil. It's just, it's, it's like work together, work with each other. Um, and, uh, you know, I feel that's been something I've learned is that humans got in the way really of our soils and tried to control it and go, oh, I know best and we can do this and we can do that. And it just has proven over time that that's not going to work. Um, so we just need to move out of the way and let nature do what nature does best and let the soils heal and forgive and repair and, um, and keep giving in, in, in abundance. Um, yeah, I'm really excited about this space and I can't wait to see how it all unfolds. I am going to be doing the course with everyone as well. I feel like, you know, I am, just as much as a student, as a mentor and uh, educator, I love learning. One of my principles is sharpen the saw. The um, previous podcast was all about, you know, raise a sharp show. It was all about sharpening the saw. Seventh habit, 
yeah. um, of seven highly effective habits is sharpen the I'm salt. Always reading too. Yeah, yeah. I've got. I, I I do more audio books. That's why I love seeing that you're converting your book into an audio. I was like, whoa! Like, and I love how you're just dripping it out. You know, you're just doing it bit by bit, you know, and you're giving everyone chapter one and then chapter two and then and, and so forth. You're not waiting for it all to be finished and then delay that process. You know, I love that, um, that, 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 that way of doing things. And I'm an audio book type of person. I love watching things and listening to things yeah. on double speed and, and uh, just downloading it into my brain, you know, but that's a process. It's taken me years and years of personal development to, to get to that point. Matt, I think we have to wrap up soon. Um, I know you're getting to your late night. <clears throat> I'm getting to my midday. Everyone, soil lovers, it's been absolutely a pleasure having this uh, conversation. I see it as an absolute gift to everyone to just keep learning and digging deeper into our soils. Matt, any final words for our soil loving community? Grow abundantly, learn daily, and live regeneratively. And hopefully I will see you in the new course, Regenerative Soil. Thanks, Thanks. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. Get outside, dig deeper into your soils. Well, soil lovers, that's enough secrets for one episode. I really hope that you enjoyed all the secrets shared during this conversation. But hey, let's not keep it a secret. Please share this podcast around and make sure that you like it and leave us a review because that really helps spread the secrets of the soil. Until next time, remember, get outside, get your hands dirty and keep digging deeper into your soils.